So we're just going to recap what we just talked about. So how do we figure out where our function is increasing or decreasing? The idea is that if we look at our arbitrary function here, the places where it's increasing, so it's increasing there, and it's increasing there, those are precisely the places where the derivative is positive. So f is increasing, and that's exactly when the derivative is positive. What about where it's decreasing? So in this middle portion, we got that our function is decreasing. And that's precisely when the derivative is negative. At all these points along where it's decreasing, the derivative is negative there. That's a nice way to figure out where a function is increasing and where it's decreasing. Just compute the derivative and figure out where it's positive and where it's negative. So let's go ahead and do that. Find the open intervals on the axes for which this degree 4 polynomial is increasing and those on which it's decreasing. So by what we did above, we just want to look at what the sign is of the derivative. Where is it positive? Where is it negative? So we'll take its derivative, 12x cubed minus 12x squared minus 24x. We need to figure out where that's positive and where that's negative. So it's going to help if we know where it's zero, because then we can look on the intervals between the zeros to figure out where it's positive and negative. So that means we're going to be, it's going to be helpful for us if we factor this. So I can factor it to 12x from everything, and I'm left with an x squared minus an x minus a 2. And that's 12x, and that quadratic happens to factor as x minus 2, x plus 1. So where is it positive and where is it negative? Well, we can see where it's 0. Where is the derivative 0? So I'm looking at the derivative here. In fact, I'm looking at the sign of the derivative. It's 0 at negative 1. It's 0 at 0. And it's 0 at 2. So those are the places where the derivative is 0. Let's jot that down. f prime of x is 0 when x is negative 1, 0, and 2. Remember, these were the critical numbers. Okay, so once we have the critical numbers, once we know the places where the derivative is 0, or possibly doesn't exist, we can look between them and see is it positive or negative there. Now, there's a quick way to do it in this example. Noticing that this is a cubic, the derivative here is a cubic polynomial. It's a cubic polynomial where the highest degree term has a positive coefficient. So the end behavior of this cubic polynomial behaves exactly the same way as just the polynomial where those lower degree terms are, have gone. So it behaves roughly like a 12x cubed function. So that's the end behavior. It looks roughly like 12x cubed. So it's got to go down to negative infinity and then up to positive infinity. And with these lower order terms present, it means it could possibly bounce up and down, maybe once. So that's our rough sketch of what f prime looks like. We know there's three roots, so we know that the horizontal axis has to be crossed in this way, and there's going to be a 0 there, a negative 1 there, and a 2 there. And from that, we, didn't do, we don't need any other bits of information except this diagram to say that, oh, well, therefore, this is our graph of f prime, therefore the derivative is negative to the left of negative 1, it's positive between negative 1 and 0, it's negative between 0 and 2, and it's positive to the right of 2. And so there's our sign chart. So we exactly know now where the function is increasing and decreasing. It's increasing wherever you see the sign of the derivative being positive, so let's just jot that down here. What's f doing? It's decreasing here, it's increasing there, it's decreasing here, it's increasing there, and we've got our intervals of increase and decrease. So we have that f is increasing on the interval negative 1 to 0, union the interval from 2 to infinity, and f is decreasing on the interval from negative infinity to negative 1, union the interval from 0 to 2. Okay, so notice what we've done here. We wanted to figure out where func the function f was increasing and decreasing, so we had to analyze the sign of its derivative. We do a sign analysis on its derivative, from the sign analysis on the derivative, we get information back about 
the original function f and where it's increasing and decreasing. Now you'll notice I, I took a really quick method to come up with a sign chart. I used the fact that I knew what a cubic function roughly looked like, sort of sketched a graph, and then was able to pull off the signs. Now, in some situations, we might not be able to quickly discern what the, the sketch of the derivative looked like and be able to pull off these signs as easily. So what can we do in those cases? Well, in those cases, you can just pick test points from each of the intervals. So for example, if I want to know what the sign is to the left of negative 1 of the derivative, what I do is I just pick a point to the left of negative 1 and evaluate it. So what's f prime of negative 2? I throw it into f prime. Now it's probably best to work out with the, fac work with the factored form because all I care about is the sign of this thing. What is the sign of it? It's 12 times negative 2 times negative 2 minus 2 times negative 2 plus 1. And then I look at this and I say, well, that's positive. That's negative. That's negative. That's negative. So I've got three negatives. Multiply by a positive has to be negative, and so maybe I'll draw it in another color because we're pretending that we're deriving these things without actually knowing what they were from the other method. So that's a negative. So we've got the first one by just picking a test point. How do I know the values of the derivative at all points to the left of negative 1 have to be negative even though I just sampled one point? Well, the idea is suppose that there was another point to the left of negative 1 where the derivative was positive. So you've got one point where the derivative is negative, you've got another point where the derivative is positive. Well, the derivative is a continuous function, so it's got to connect these two points. So it's got to cross the axes between those two points, the intermediate value theorem. Is there a place that it crosses the axes between those two points? Well, if the two points are to the left of negative 1, it can't cross the axes there because we've already jotted down precisely the three spots where it does cross the axes. And so there is no point to the left of negative 1 where it crosses the axes. So two points to the left of negative 1 can't have different signs. They have to have the same sign. So we pick one test point. We find out it's negative. All the points to the left of negative 1 have to also be negative. The sign of the derivative has to also be negative. So let's look at the next interval, negative 1 to 0. So I'm going to look at negative 0 0.5. That's a point between negative 1 and 0. Just pick one test point. doesn't matter where it is. I test its value. Test its sign is really all I care about, not the magnitude of the value. So I pop it in here, that's 12 times negative 0 0.5, that's negative 0 0.5 minus 2, and negative 0 0.5 plus 1. So this is a positive, negative, negative, positive. So the product of two negatives is a positive, so that's a positive value there. Again, I'm just rewriting over, we found it one way, the things in red are the conclusions we get from doing it this other way using test points, pretending that we didn't do it using the graph of the derivative before. So what about the next interval from 0 to 2? Well, there I can take a sample point or a test point of x equals 1, plug it into the derivative, and we get, maybe I won't even write it down, we'll just do it quickly here. We're looking at 12 times 1, that's a positive number, so 12, 1 minus 2, that's negative, 1 plus 1, that's positive. So we got positive times negative times positive, so that has to be negative. And then finally, we're looking at a test point to the left of, or sorry, to the right of 2, so maybe 3. So I go back to my derivative. 12 times 3, that's positive. 3 minus 2, that's positive. 3 plus 1, that's positive. So it's going to be the product of positive, positive, and positive. So it's positive. And there's our last two values. So we can get them either from the graph or, worst case scenario, we go ahead and we work out test points at each of the intervals and in, within each of the intervals to figure out what the sign of the derivative is. However you get it, you get the signs of the derivative and then you can immediately read off where the function is increasing and decreasing. Okay, from that, I want to move on to the first derivative test. Now, in our preliminary discussion, we were talking about the first derivative test as a way to classify a critical number as either a local max or a local min, or perhaps neither. And so here we've just written it out in full detail. And this is the idea. Well, actually, let's scroll back up to here because the idea is really present in this previous example. What's the idea? Well, the critical numbers, we've already listed them. Here's a critical number, negative 1. And the question is, is there a local max or a local min of the function at negative 1? Well, that we can read off 
from how the function is increasing or decreasing. We see that to the left of negative one it's decreasing, and then to the right it's increasing. So at negative one, as I'm screaming towards negative one, my x values are getting closer and closer to negative one, and then they scream past it, my function is dropping, 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 and then it turns around and goes back up again. So I know that negative one, there has to be a local min there. What about at zero? Well, the function's increasing until we hit a value at x value of zero, and then it decreases. So that has to be a local max occurring there. And then similarly, I'm decreasing to the left of two, increasing to the right, so there is a local min there. We've classified now the critical numbers as local max or local min, and all we used to do that was the sign of the first derivative, or in other words, where the function was increasing and decreasing. That is precisely what the first derivative tells us. So suppose you're staring at a critical number of a continuous function, and suppose that the derivative changes from positive to negative at c. So we're at some value c here, and we go from positive, derivative being positive, or function's increasing, to the derivative being negative on the other side, or function's decreasing. So what has to happen at c? There has to be a local max there. That's what that says. What about in the case it changes from negative to positive? So again, just a quick sketch. It goes from neg negative derivative or decreasing function to a increasing function, and so that would have had to have been a local min. Now what if the derivative doesn't change sign at all? So what happens if you go from, so we're at our value c, and you go from increasing to a derivative of zero, because it's a critical number, back to increasing again? Well, it can't be a local max or local min, because to the left there are values smaller than the function value at c, and to the right there are values bigger than the function value at c. So what actually happened here is the function seemed to have come up, come up, gone horizontal a little bit, or gone flat, and then back up again. Kind of hard to tell from my diagram here, but it looks something like that. The alternative, maybe I'll draw the, the picture first, the alternative is it could be negative, the derivative could be negative on either side of c, so in which case it's decreasing, 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 goes flat temporarily, and then starts to decrease again. So it's decreasing, decreasing, and at c it levels out, but again it's neither a local max nor a local min, because to the left there are values bigger than the function value at c, and to the right there are values smaller than the function value at c. So the first derivative test says if you want to classify the local extrema for a max or min, just look on either side of it and see what the function is doing. Is it increasing or decreasing on either side? So let's go ahead and classify the local extrema of this function. Well, you'll notice we already did that. This is the same function that we have above, and we already classified the local extrema. We found the local max and local min from the intervals on which the function is increasing and which is decreasing. So maybe we'll just jot this down. We did this above. So let's look at another example where we classify the local extrema. In this case, we're going to classify the local extreme of f of x equals absolute value of x. Now you may look at this function and say, well, there's really not much we need to do here. The absolute value function looks like this. And so where are the local extrema? Well, there's only one local extrema. It's happening right there at the origin. And it's a local min. So we really don't have to do anything here. Well, the reason this example is here is because I want to bring back to your attention that where can the local extrema occur? The candidates are the critical numbers. Where are the critical, or how are the critical numbers found? Well, these are found by the places where either the derivative is zero or where the derivative doesn't exist. In the previous example, the critical numbers were three places where the derivative was zero. It didn't come up, this idea that uh, we had a critical number where the derivative didn't exist. That's where this example is, is used to serve its purpose. So what are the critical numbers here? So let's go through and apply the methods. Even though we could get this immediately from the graph, let's just go through and see what our, our methods of finding local extrema tell us in this case. So the critical numbers. We're going to find the places where the derivative is zero or where the derivative does not exist. 
it's the second case that really is of interest to us here. So what is the derivative of this function? Well, the derivative of this function, it's a piecewise defined function. When I'm to the right of zero, so for positive x values, the derivative is one. So if x is bigger than zero, and to the left of it, it's negative one. That's if x is less than zero. And what about at zero? Well, at zero, it's not differentiable, so we have to leave equality off here because it's not differentiable at zero. So where is the derivative of zero, or where does it not exist? Where is it zero? Well, it's never zero, because the derivative is either positive one or negative one. Where doesn't it exist? It doesn't exist at zero. So there's our critical number. We've got a critical number of x equals zero. Now I want to classify, or maybe I'll say, uh, find the local extrema. To do this, we already know the candidates. There's one candidate, x equals zero. How do I know whether it's a max or a min? Well, I look at the sign of its derivative and figure out where the function is increasing and decreasing. To the left of zero, the derivative is negative one, so it's negative. To the right of zero, the derivative is positive one, so it's positive. So what does that tell me about my function? It tells me that it's decreasing and then moves to increasing. And therefore, by the first derivative test, it tells us that there is a local min at x equals zero. So we have then that the local min is at zero and has a value of zero. Okay. So again, just an example to look at the case where we have a critical number that came up because it was a place where the derivative didn't exist. We still go through and apply the first derivative test. We can still look to the left and to the right to see what the sign of the derivative is, and that'll tell us whether it's a local max or a local min.